Well, this week we're going to continue in our new series of the Blessed Life. Uh, and so just to give you a recap if you weren't here last week. And I also want to say, if you weren't here last week, um, you can always catch the previous week's sermon, or actually every sermon that I have preached here is online uh, at uh, calvarylighthouse.org. Just go to sermons. You can go back through. And so for the last year and a half, we, have, we put them all online typically. Uh, you can catch them on Facebook on Sundays, um, but if you've ever tried to go back through a Facebook timeline to catch something you missed the day before, uh, it's hard to do. But we actually post them typically. It's Monday uh, morning, Monday afternoon. They're up on the, the website. Uh, and so if you weren't here last week, I would encourage you to go back, because this is a four-week series that we're doing, talking about the blessed life. And last week, uh, we talked about what does it mean to be blessed. And where we ended up that is a, a blessed life is a happy life with God working in our favor. Oftentimes, blessed is translated into financial prosperity, uh, and we didn't necessarily want to go down that road because financial prosperity, uh, well, some, we, we know some people that are wealthy and uh, wicked, and some people that are holy and poor. And so it's not always financially prosperous when we talk about a blessed life. And so we determined a blessed life is a happy life with God working in our favor. And that the first step needed in all of our lives uh, to move into a blessed life is a heart transplant. It's a heart transplant. We need to give up a selfish heart. We need to give up a grieving heart. We need to develop a generous heart and develop a grateful heart. And as we talked about giving last week, we expanded our understanding to to see that giving is about much more than just money. If we give judgment, we receive judgment. If we give wrath, we receive wrath. If we give generosity, we receive generosity. And so if you missed it last week, I'd encourage you to go back and uh, listen to it online uh, because I think it will uh, be of help and benefit to you because I, I really think this is a, a foundational message for who we are as a church and where God's leading us. And so this week we're going to hit on the second part of a blessed life. And that second part uh, is called obedience. Obedience. You know, in today's society, obedience is almost a a bad word. It implies that there's rules for people to follow or somebody to be submitted to. Even in the church, if you talk too much about a standard of obedience or holiness, all of a sudden you get accused of being legalistic, right? Churches are funny. People are funny. We don't really like people telling us what to do, do we? No, we don't, we don't like it. And I, you know, I, I think that's one of the challenges that we have in church is that we oftentimes, or in life in general, we want to go with what we feel is the right thing. Uh, and so, I don't know, we've talked about this before, but, you know, in, in life, depends on how you look at it, most people look at uh, rules. You know, in, in life, there's, there's, there's sets of rules, right? And how many of you would say, I'm a really good rule follower? How many, raise your hand. You're a good rule follower, yeah. How many of you say, you know, the rules were written for everybody else? I'm not just asking you to raise your hand. I'm raising your hand, my hand as one of that, those people. You know, in life, there's red rules and blue rules. Uh, red rules do not bend, do not break. You ever, they apply to everybody. Uh, blue rules, on the other hand, those can flex and give. And uh, depend on your personality, depends on whether you think most rules are red or most rules are blue. I'm of the opinion most rules are blue. And so uh, it drives Heather nuts at times. Like when we were at Disney World uh, last year, um, I proved that you can talk your way onto pretty much any ride, uh, whether you have a fast pass or not. Now, we, didn't, we never lied. We don't lie. But we, you know, we just, we, hey, we're with that group there, which we were with that group. They had a fast pass. But Heather's like, no, just go through the line. I'm like, no, we can get this way. That's for everybody else. It's not for me. Red rules, blue rules, Obedience. Now, I think I do a pretty good job of obeying God. I think I, think I do a pretty good job. But, you know, I want to actually, I actually want to grow in my obedience to God. Uh, we could always improve. We could always, uh, I, I really, I want to obey quicker than I do. Uh, I want to obey without question or doubt. Really, imagine waking up every day and praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Or just praying, God, let me hear and sense your voice and immediately obey you. I don't want to miss an opportunity because of disobedience. And I I want to see what God could do through me 
if I make immediate obedience a priority. Now think about this. How many times have you missed an opportunity because you didn't immediately obey? How many times have you ever said, I know God wants me to do that, but I can't do it right now because it didn't fit our schedule? Or are there times when you know that you were out of his will and plan? You know the solution to that? The solution to that is immediate obedience. Because if we give ourselves time, what do we do? We eventually talk ourselves out of it or we forget. It's like asking your kids to put their shoes away, right? If you don't ask them to do it when they first come in the door, those shoes are going to somehow end up in the pantry. Because they put them away, but not where you asked them to put away, and they didn't do it immediately. And we're the same way. We ask our, you know, God asks us to do all sorts of things, and if we don't re- respond immediately, oftentimes we get behind and we forget exactly what God asked us to do, and so we kind of do what we think we're supposed to do, but we're not necessarily responding immediately. Here's my goal with the message this morning. I'm praying that, that people in our congregation will take a radical and bold step to pray every day. Thy will be done. And to grow in immediate obedience to God. And in doing so, will find their way into the blessed life that God has for them. Now think about obedience in this way. Why would God bless us with more opportunity and responsibility if we aren't obeying him in the small things of life? Obedience opens the door to bigger the bigger things of God. When we are faithful with small things, greater things come. Now, does this make you a little nervous when we start talking about obedience? I I know, I understand, I've, I've been there. Because obedience sometimes means that you have to do things um, that you aren't comfortable with, that you didn't come up with. There's definitely some anxiety there. We think, you know, what will God ask me to do? What's it going to cost me? What will I have to give up? Can I really do it? And it's kind of interesting, really, that, that most of our anxiety and most of our doubts and fear is based on what we might lose or have to give up. Why? Because we're willful people and we want what we want. We want to do what we want to do. We don't want anyone telling us what to do, even if they do think they're God or actually are. Isn't it funny? We should fear what we, we we fear what we should lose or give up. We've been conditioned the wrong way. You know, I've heard people say this before. uh, God, don't tell God you won't go to Africa because he'll send you there. You ever heard anybody say that? Don't tell God, don't tell God you won't do something because he'll call you to do it. Don't say you'll never marry a pastor because God will make you do it. Don't say, as Pastor Joe comforts Christy. (laughs) That's a twisted perspective on God, isn't it? It's a twisted perspective on obedience. Don't tell God you won't do something because he's going to tell you to do it. God is not looking for opportunities to say, I'm going to make you as miserable as possible if you obey me. That's not what God's saying. Instead, obedience positions you to be in the middle of his will. It might not be where you thought you were going, but it's where God desires you to be. Now, as we get into this conversation about immediate obedience, I, I want to I start with some basic assumptions that are necessary for us to obey God. Here's the first one, and you've heard me say it before, and I really mean it. God has a plan for you. That's the first thing we have to understand as we talk about obedience. God has a plan for you. And God's plan for you is better than your plan for you. God's way is better than than your way. I've got Isaiah 58, 8. It's actually Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. I'm sorry. Um, 
at least we know there is an Isaiah 58, unlike Luke 37 as of last week. Here's what Isaiah 55, 8 says. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. If, if you think you know better than God, you won't obey. If you think you know better than God, you won't obey. Now, we laugh at that a little bit. We chuckle a little bit, say, well, no, I know I'm not smarter than God. But how many people do we know that live as though they think they're smarter than God? They may not say it that way. I mean, really, that would be audacious, wouldn't it, to say I'm smarter than God? I mean, that would, I think pretty much everyone around is going to smack you down if you say that, right? But we demonstrate it in our own lives, don't we? With our words and our behaviors. In our relationships, have we sought God first? I was talking to a pastor uh, when I was in Haiti a couple weeks ago, and uh, a, a church board had invited him in to um, interview. And he started, he goes, now I'm going to trust that you have prayed and fasted before you invited me in. And he said, they said, no, we, we, we've reviewed our resumes, we did pray about it, we, we prayed a little bit about it, but we didn't spend an extended ter- time of prayer or fasting, we just felt you were the most qualified candidate. And he said, okay, well, let me stop you here. I am not your person. And they, they said, would you please reconsider? They said, no, because what you're telling me, this is the pastor. He goes, now this is my opportunity to teach you. He goes, the most important decision in your church's life right now is deciding who's going to be the next pastor. And you're telling me you haven't prayed and fasted about it. You're not ready to make this decision. But see, oftentimes in relationships and in job decisions and in career choices, how we handle our finances, how we handle our habits, how we handle our words, we go with what we feel is the right thing without necessarily confirming that this is God's desire and direction for our life. You know, oftentimes people ask me for advice. And if I ask them, have you prayed about it? And they say, well, I thought I'd get some advice first. Really, they're starting in the wrong place. If we're not pursuing God in our decisions, how are we going to know if we're going to obey him? Because we might make a decision based upon our feelings. And if we follow our feelings rather than what God's Holy Spirit is saying, that's what we're saying. We're saying that I think my feelings are more valid than God. I'm smarter than God is what we're saying. But we wouldn't say that out loud, would we? And it's difficult to find another explanation other than they think they know better than God. Uh, I mean, maybe they've decided, much like I do with a lot of rules, that perhaps God's instructions don't apply to me. Well, that would be silly. But people do this, don't they? They decide that. I I guess the only other possibility is that uh, they're filled with sin. Um, They're not that smart or they're just stubborn. None of those are good qualities, are we? Are they? And so uh, we have to recognize that God has a plan for us. And if we don't believe God has a plan for us, then we're going to have a challenge in obeying. Here's the second thing I want us to recognize as we talk about a basic assumption about obedience. First is that God still speaks. God still speaks to the lives of individuals and gives specific instructions. Obeying God then requires that we know his instructions or hear his voice. You can't obey God if you don't know what he says. How does God speak? Here's a quick overview of how God speaks to us. First and foremost, through his word. Through his word. There are a lot of areas where we don't have to search or even pray to discover God's instructions because he's already written them down for us. They are very clearly explained in his word, the Bible. And it's difficult to pretend you don't know these instructions, right? Because they're right there. They've been there for us my entire life. I've had access to the Bible. It's part of the reason why so many churches struggle today. Because biblical literacy is at an all-time low. People don't read their Bibles anymore. People read their Bibles just to find information. Or what they've done is they've gone to searching for verses that provide comfort in that certain situation, but they don't really study God's Word. If we're not reading our Bible, it's going to be very hard for us to recognize God's voice because he's clearly laid out many things for us. The second way that he speaks to us is through others. 
spiritual authorities, people that have, are further along in their relationship with Jesus, a message, a book. Now, I want, you to, I want to give you a warning, okay? Now, we are a Pentecostal church, and we believe God speaks to, to, to people today. But I still want to give a warning. Be very cautious of people who have uh, God's instruction for your life. People come to you and say, I have a word from God for you. Does God speak that way? Absolutely. But this way is often abused or misunderstood. It's really, um, oftentimes, it's difficult to separate God's word from their motives. Here's some questions you can ask as you try and evaluate a word from God given by an individual. This this is important because I believe God speaks through people today. I believe that. I've done that. I've had done to me. I've experienced God's word. But we have to ask ourselves some questions. Because not everyone that has come to me and said, I've got a word from the Lord from you, is really giving me a word from the Lord. It's from their emotions. It's from their feelings. And I think most of them mean well. But just because somebody says it's a word from God doesn't mean it is a word from God. So here's some, here's some criteria. First, what's their track record? Personally, with you or with others. If they lack discernment in their own life, you should really doubt their ability to hear God's word for your life. In other words, if they have a history of uh, personal failure or relationship failures, be very cautious about trusting their discernment or judgment for your life. Here's the second thing that we can ask about. Who is their spiritual authority? Now take great caution from words that people give you when they are not under a spiritual authority. There's lots of wacky things out there. Okay? One of the first questions I ask when people uh, want to partner with us in ministry, which is a regular conversation, I ask them, what church do you attend? When we were out in California, we spent, seven, we spent uh, six years, five years, at a, uh, what is would be considered a very strongly prophetic-oriented church. And we would have people that would come in on a regular basis and they declare themselves a prophet. They weren't connected to any ministry. They weren't connected to any broader organization. They weren't connected to any chat church. If you asked them who their pastor was, they couldn't answer the question. They were a prophet unto themselves. And when they found out that we weren't going to just automatically give a platform, guess what? They left. Now, I want you to understand, God still speaks through people. God will use you to speak to people. But not everybody that says they have a word from God really does. You know, there's a lot of prophets and preachers who travel around and give people words. The problem is they have no accountability or spiritual authority. Personally, I wouldn't attend those meetings. Here's the third thing we can look at. Is their word a confirming word or a new revelation? Most of the time, the prophetic gifts that God gives are used for comfort, encouragement, and edification. And they should be confirmation of what God is already speaking to you. Here's another criteria. This is probably one of the biggest ones. Is their word consistent with the Bible? God, any personal word that contradicts God's written word is a deception and a lie. Run from that word and don't let that person be a leader or influencer in your life. Is the word confirmed by spirit by your spiritual authorities? You should have spiritual authorities in your life, more than just me as your pastor. There should be those that you're submitted to that help you to grow. That's why we like small groups so much, so you can develop those relationships. God has given your spiritual authorities responsibility for your spiritual growth and journey. If they are reluctant concerning a word someone has given you, be very cautious about that word. Now, this is hard for pastors sometimes. Because there are people that want to be used in that prophetic ministry. And as a pastor, oftentimes I'm privy to information about people because of their relationship to their church and to me that makes me know they're not a good source of God's word for your life right now. And so oftentimes I have to uh, ask people to be cautious. Really let the Holy Spirit speak to you and see if he confirms what that's supposed to mean to you. 
Here's the next question I, I, you need to ask yourself as you're discerning if it's God's word for your life. Does their word appeal to your ego? God has given me a word for you. You're going to have millions of dollars, hundreds of followers. You're going to have the most beautiful wife, the best house. We're like, yeah, I, I received that word. Well, yeah. Who's, going to, who's not going to receive that word? Listen. If it, if it appeals to your ego, be cautious. That's how manipulative people gain a following or something, uh, sometimes a big offering. If somebody offers to sell you miracle water from Chernobyl, please tell them no. You laugh. There was an evangelist doing it in the 90s. Miracle water from Chernobyl. Here's another question. Is their word generic or specific? I've watched too many so-called prophets give people a really generic word. God wants you to succeed. God wants the best for your life. Well, yeah. It's not a prophetic word. It's in the Bible. Is it specific? I've had some really specific words spoken to my life. I believe in it. But we still have to discern, right? If it's really God, that the person is going to be able to pinpoint something that God is specifically saying. Here's another one which I think is really important. Do they have something to gain if you follow their word? This is really a motive question. Now, I know what you're saying. You hear all these questions, you say, Pastor Spencer sounds skeptical of people giving prophetic words. I want, I want to guard you, um, I want to guard you, because this is my job as a shepherd. I believe in the prophetic ministry. But I want you to understand that when the end times come, those that lead the church astray aren't going to come with big signs that say, I'm leading the church astray. They're going to come with partial truths that sound spiritual, that sound like they could be from God. That's why we have to be cautious. I am skeptical of anyone, honestly, that I don't know that comes to declare themselves a prophet. And these are the questions I ask. And uh, I want to guard you from putting too much stock in special words and neglecting God's written word. I want to protect you from people who may not have your best interest at heart. Because we've all experienced, we can see through the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, those that have manipulated the church for their own benefit. Does God still speak today? Absolutely. He speaks through other people. Another way that God speaks to us is through impressions. God can speak in an audible voice. Of course he can. He's God. But it's extremely rare in Scripture that we see it. And it's extremely rare in our lives that we see it. God can lead us. We never had an audible voice to tell us to come to Lakewood, New Jersey. Heather and I prayed. And each time we prayed, we felt that God left the door open. And we followed that direction of peace for us to walk through it. Have I ever heard the audible voice of God? No, I've heard pretty close to it where God has given me some directions and said, this is what you're going to do. But I haven't heard the audible voice of God. It's been in my spirit. But he still speaks that way. But he also speaks through impressions. He also speaks through desires. Through the desires of our heart. What's Psalms uh, 37, 3, it says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, is this verse talking about a Ferrari? I don't think so. Instead, when you trust God, do good and delight yourself in him, then your desires will be in line with his plan. I wouldn't really trust my desires unless the other things were in line. Because I'm selfish, right? Right? I want what I want. You know, as I study and as we, we grow in practicing obedience, it does seem that there's a progression 
in obedience. If you won't obey his written word, don't expect God to uh, share his voice with you or sense him through impressions. If you do, uh, that impression is probably telling you to uh, read his word. Right? What is the highest authority for the church today? God is the highest authority. And what has he given us as our primary source of knowing his will for our lives? It is his written word. It's indisputable. If you aren't willing to obey the word of God, then you are choosing to live in disobedience and experience the consequences. It's a very important principle. A word from God will never contradict his written word. It's one of the things that brought me concern about a large church. I'm not going to name that church, but several years ago, several years ago, probably at this point six years ago, they decided to separate from their denomination. They separated from their denomination because they felt they had a new revelation from God. That they had a new interpretation of the Bible. You know, my hermeneutics teacher, hermeneutics is the, the study of Scripture in context, um, what it meant historically and, and such. My hermeneutics teacher, he always told us, listen, if you're studying a Scripture and you come up with a translation of that Scripture that nobody else has come up with in history, you're probably wrong. Because the, the Bible has been studied for a couple thousand years at this point. And so if you come up with something new that no one else has come up with, you've probably missed it. That's why we study the Word of God. And that's why we trust the word of God. You know, people often say things like, I, I think God wants me to be happy. Show me that in the Bible. Actually, the Bible says in this life you will have trouble. But take heart. You know, it's like when they were writing uh, the original Constitution, uh, they wanted to guarantee life, liberty, and they originally wanted to inc include and happiness. But you can include happiness as a guarantee. So what does it say? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Nowhere in the Bible does it say God wants you to be happy. He wants us to serve him and love him. Uh, I actually heard this one time, and uh, somebody told me, I don't have to forgive that person. They haven't asked for it. That, that's actually the exact opposite of what the Word of God says. The starting point for obedience is the Bible. For many of us, uh, we have just found the first hurdle in our journey to a blessed life of obedience. We've got to line up with what we already know. That comes first. Here's another thing we need to remember about obedience. Obedience is a learned behavior. Hebrews chapter 5, uh, verse 7, it says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petition with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. He was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Jesus learned obedience. If he had to learn obedience, don't you think that we will have to learn obedience also? It's interesting, but the more you obey, the easier it becomes to obey the next time. You discover the benefits of obedience and you develop a habit. Obedience leads to more obedience. The fourth thing I want us to know about obedience is that uh, the best and safe, safe, safest place to be is the center of God's will. Immediate obedience ensures that you are in his will. I'd rather be in a dangerous place in the will of God than a safe place out of his will. The safest place is to be in the center of God's will. The most dangerous place to be is out of his will. You know, as we talked about the blessed life, as we talk about the blessed life, here's an important thing I want us to remember. Blessings follow obedience. Isaiah 1.19, it says, If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. 
for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I assume you want to obey God because you want to live in his blessing. Joshua 1, seven it says, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. In order to be successful, Joshua first had to be obedient. You will never enjoy the full blessings of God if you refuse to obey the instructions of God. Obedience leads to the blessed life. You say, well, then why wouldn't somebody obey God immediately? Well, I don't know. Actually, I have some thoughts. But how many of you have struggled with obedience? I think we all have. I have. Why? Because I'm a selfish person. I want what I want. I don't like people telling me what to do. Very few of us really do enjoy it. So let's look at some of the obstacles to obedience. I think the first uh, obstacle to obedience is reason. Reason. God, this doesn't make sense to me. How many people in the Bible did something that didn't make sense in response to God's instruction? So, you know, Joseph married Mary, even though she was pregnant at the time. Gideon fought a battle with just a few men. David faced a giant with a slingshot. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went into the fire. Jesus went to a cross. That doesn't make sense to anybody. Philippians 2.8 says, And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see what I'm saying? Not every instruction from God will always make human sense. Think about some of the things the Bible tells us to do. We talk about tithing. Give away 10% and you'll have more. Honor others. Put them first. Forgive others. Turn the other cheek. These are instructions from the Word of God that don't necessarily make sense in today's culture and society, do they? Now be careful. Just because something doesn't make sense, it doesn't mean it's from God. Sometimes it's just dumb. But God's instructions might not always make perfect sense to you. God doesn't necessarily show you the end. He might just show you the next step. Because before you can get to the third step, you have to be obedient in the first and second step. One of the other things that can oftentimes uh, run us off the road of obedience is other people's opinions. Have you ever had somebody try and talk you out of something? The reality is they can't hear God's voice for you. You have to decide, are you going to live by other people's opinions or God's instructions? Galatians 1.10, it says, am I now trying to win the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Other people will not always cheer for you to obey God. When I accepted the invitation to become the children's pastor at church in Carlsbad, California, my mother was not happy for me. Trust me, we stood in the kitchen with her crying, tears streaming down her face. And I said, can't you just be happy for me? And she said, no, because I don't want you to move to California. But I knew it was what God wanted for me. Now, she didn't want me to move to California because it was just too far away, and I am her favorite. <laughs> and if my sister and brother are watching today... It's true, and you know it. <laughs> I have been replaced as their favorite. <laughs> it's true, and I know it. But I know it was God's will for me to move. And what did I get out of the deal? Heather. Heather was in California. People won't always celebrate what God's calling you to do, but do it anyways. Obey 
God. One of the other challenges in obedience is past disobedience. In the same way that obedience is learned, disobedience is learned as well. In the same way that obedience can become a pattern, disobedience can become a pattern. What do we call a life built on a pattern of disobedience? We call it rebellion. Disobedience sets you on your own direction. Once you are headed your way, it's all too easy to stay on that course. And that leads to what the Bible describes as a hard heart. When you no longer listen for or hear the voice of God, I pray that God would always guard my heart so that it remains soft and sensitive to his leading and that I would not harden my heart against his word. And sometimes that means I have to revisit things and say, God, am I listening to you? Have I heard you here? Have I heard you? Many people stay in disobedience until they find themselves in deep, deep trouble. You know, as a pastor, one of the challenges we have is that oftentimes um, I do have to provide a word of correction. You know, people don't take that well a lot. They bristle. Well, pastor, you don't really know me that well. I understand I don't know you as as fully as I'd like, but I can tell you from what I'm seeing in your behavior. Man, you want to see somebody leave your church quick? Correct them. Now, I know none of you are like that, and so we're all good, but the reality is when we live in rebellion, we don't want anybody to tell us that. But that's the hard thing as a pastor. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The, 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 the shepherd carried a rod and a staff. The, the rod was a little more substantial than the staff. The staff had the crook, right, that he could use to rescue sheep. You know what the rod could do? Fight off animals and occasionally smack the sheep back into line because sheep needed to be followed. Now, that's the reality. That's the role as a shepherd. But when we live constantly in a state of rebellion, it's challenging. And we always provide correction and love, but not everyone receives it that way. And if somebody provides a word of correction to you and your first response is to bristle and leave, you need to check your heart. You know, another reason that people uh, delay or they avoid obedience is uh, fear of failure. What if this isn't God? What if I'm wrong? What if God isn't really saying this to me? Another one is fear of embarrassment. If I miss it, what will people think? If I try to do this and I fail, if I obey and say that this is God's desire, what will they think? Which matters more? What people think or obeying God? Laziness is another reason why people sometimes don't obey God. Now, we don't want to think about that. But once we get on that couch of comfort, whew, watching football, watching Ohio State beat everybody. You knew it was coming. You know, it takes more work to obey. It requires action on your part. Disobedience is relatively easy in the short run. You just ignore what God's saying. In the long run, though, it's much more painful and difficult to live a life of disobedience. You know, another reason that we, uh, we struggle with obedience is we have the wrong friends in our lives. Obedient, o- obedient friends create an atmosphere where obedience is celebrated. Disobedient friends create the opposite atmosphere. The last thing disobedient friends want you to do is to follow God, because if you do, it makes them look bad. And it makes it obvious that they aren't. So they put pressure on you to join them in disobedience if you could only see the end result of that. You know, another reason that people live in disobedience is the absence of a spiritual authority in their life. People who live without spiritual authority aren't used to being obedient. And they lack a key check and balance in their life. It might be like what came first, the chicken or the egg? Uh, kind of question. Are you disobedient because you lack spiritual authority or do you lack spiritual authority because you're disobedient? I'm not sure, but it's an observed pattern. People who live outside of a spiritual authority live outside of God's authority more often than not. That's why I'm, I'm reluctant to work with independent ministries. I want to work with people that are under 
authority. You know, as a church, we get a call, we get calls on a pretty regular basis from independent missionaries, from independent ministries that say, we want to partner with you. And here, most of the time when they say, we want to partner with you, what that actually translates into, you have a really big building. I want to use it for free. They don't actually want to partner with us. And they don't necessarily want us to speak into their organization. And they're independent. Listen, anybody can start an independent ministry. Fire up a YouTube channel and boom, there you go. But if somebody can't tell you who the spiritual authority in their life is, if they're not submitted to others, it should give you a pause. I'm a credentialed, I'm, a, I'm an ordained minister of the Assemblies of God. Um, we are an Assemblies of God church. When I have a question, spiritual or otherwise, I have several individuals that I call that speak into my life. Sometimes they tell me you're right. Sometimes they tell me I'm wrong. And guess what? They're allowed to because I've asked them to be spiritual authorities in my life. Do you have that in your life? One of the other challenges that we could face in uh, obedience is those abusive spiritual authorities from our past. It's one of the saddest things that I've seen in churches. People who have been hurt in church by manipulative and angry spiritual leaders. Spiritual abuse is a very real thing. One of the classes I used to teach down in Virginia, um, it was on leadership, it was on servant leadership, and uh, it was the college that we had there. We had a couple of individuals that came to uh, our class, they, they were students at the school, but they attended a church in the area, and the senior pastor of that church had told all the single women in that church, until you're married, you're dating me, and I have the authority in your life to tell you who you can and cannot date. Well, that's kind of crazy, really. Um, because you can't have multiple people you're dating, first of all, if you're married. Uh, this, even if you're not married, you shouldn't be dating multiple people. It's hard to keep it all straight. But the reality is, you can't demand submission from someone. We're to be submitted. But oftentimes, churches have pastors that have manipulated people into submission. And they're not really submission. What they're looking for is subservience. Do what I say just because of my position. That's not relational leadership. That's not submission to spiritual authority. It's manipulation. But when that happens, oftentimes it leaves a mark. And it's really difficult to minister to people that have been hurt by past leaders that have abused them spiritually. I know people that have left churches because of manipulative leaders. And years later, they're still not attending a church. They're cynical and suspicious of spiritual leaders. They assume there's always an ulterior motive. And that current spiritual leaders don't really want their best interest. That current spiritual leaders just want to abuse them. And I just want to say this to you. It's, this isn't in the sermon. I'm sorry if you've been hurt by past leaders. I grew up under a wonderful pastor that was a strong spiritual authority, cared for people deeply, he was a godly man, transparent, 38 years as a senior pastor at the same church, never a hint of abuse or scandal. I understand not everyone's had the opportunity to grow up in a healthy spiritual environment. And I'm sorry if you've been hurt God can heal that hurt. But we can't let that hold us back from moving into submission to God's desires for our life. And if you need healing for that in a few minutes when we close, that's one of the things I want you to pray about in a few minutes. It's when you've had spiritual abuse in the past, you tend to transfer those feelings and suspicions to any other strong spiritual leader. And as a result, you, you develop a pattern of resisting strong leadership in your life. And that abuse of spiritual authority, it makes people struggle against God's authority. 
And it's one of the saddest things you can watch in someone's life. I think the last thing that people struggle with in authority and obedience is the lack of faith, trust, or confidence that God will provide. I can't obey God. I don't have the money. I don't have the time. I don't have the resources. I don't have the relationships. I don't have the whatever. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it says, May God himself, the God who makes everything holy and whole, make you holy and whole, put you together, spirit, soul, and body, and keep you fit for the coming of our master, Jesus Christ. The one who called you is completely dependable. If he said it, he'll do it. My encouragement to you this morning, as we talked about moving into the blessed life, Commit to complete and immediate obedience and see what blessings God brings into your life.